You booked it. Episode 75. Hey, entertainers and performers of the world. I'm your host, Dane Reese, and welcome to You Booked It, where I chat with inspiring entertainment professionals seven days a week. By digging into their journey, we're going to discover everything you need to do to have a successful entertainment career. You know, because training usually skips that part about how to actually make your skills work for you in the real world. Fellow entertainers, my drive here at You Booked It is to share the inspiring and incredible journeys of successful entertainment professionals. We're here to support your journey. So go to YouBookedItPodcast.com and join the You Booked It email community, where we dig deep into truly actionable things you can be doing right now to book that next audition, submission, or gig. If you enjoy this free podcast, please show your support and search for You Booked It on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app, where you can subscribe so you don't miss an episode, leave a rating, and review. And now, let's do this. Okay, let's get started. I am excited to introduce my guest today, Tristan G. Are you ready for this, Tristan? You bet. Right on. Tristan is a performer specializing in the aerial arts, particularly straps. He has experience in aerial harness work and aerial partnering in addition to his specialty. He is currently exploring the aerial arts in a completely new way, which we will get into throughout this interview. He is also an aerial artist in Cirque du Soleil's Love. Tristan, that is a quick intro of who you are and what you've done, but why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Fill in the gaps, who you are, and a little bit more about what you do as a professional in the entertainment industry. Well, um, Dane, that's uh, that's a lot for me to pounce into. But I think the most important, I would say, aspect of myself as an entertainer is that I started pretty late. So I started around the age of 27, 28 to just start training for circus in general with no previous gymnastics or dance experience. Yeah, that is amazing. And what inspired that switch? I was teaching yoga before. And so to go from that switch might seem perhaps a little bit of a 180 or or a hard right, uh, whatever you want to call it. Also known as a 90. Also known as a ninety. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, you know, we're we're uh, we're performers. We don't have to know geometry that well, but as long as we know where our limbs go. But effectively, what I think would spark that was that I I think I had always wanted to perform in some level, but I I just didn't know if I had the confidence or if I had the right kind of support. And I don't think it was until I had gotten involved with the yoga community and was sort of on the periphery of some of these circus artists that I befriended that I slowly started to realize how much more, I think, attainable that that goal could be. Uh, to me, circus and acrobatics and performance looked so, it looked so far from what I was able to do. When I was young, I was fairly as, asthmatic. That's a tough word to say, but I was fairly asthmatic. I had some bad allergies and I wasn't athletic at all. I didn't play any sports. I was non-competitive. I was a bookworm and I always felt very awkward just doing anything. Even at recess, I I didn't know what to really do aside from just maybe wander around and maybe just bring a book with me instead. So it wasn't until I'd gotten to Vegas and I was surrounded by circus, surrounded by acrobats more and more so and started working out with them that I realized that, oh, this could be something that I could actually do. Ah, that's amazing. And let's move on to this next section here. And Tristan, look, I am a sucker for a good quote. What is your favorite quote you'd like to share with everyone? Dane, this is a, I I love this question. I have on my bathroom mirror a whole bunch of different quotes that I cycle through all the time. So this actually is a tough question for me to answer. But the quote that I've been recently pondering the most is one by another entertainer, Jerry Seinfeld. And he says, the duck is the perfect model of how to live. Paddle as hard as you can beneath the surface. Let everything else roll off your back and have a little sense of humor about your appearance. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love that quote. I've never heard it before. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit on how you've incorporated that into your life and your career? Well, it's one of those quotes that I think it's it's very it's a very you know it's a very Jerry Seinfeld kind of way of putting things. I mean, there is like a little joke about it. And there's a jokiness to it. But I also think that there's a lot of seriousness to it in the sense of if we take a look at how that quote functions, the first part was just to paddle as hard as you can beneath the surface. So really, I think if you take that with you or, or as I try to do is that is to work hard and also maybe maybe not complain or whine about it because this is all done beneath the surface. You're really just trying to work, work, work and really just try to hammer everything out as in the best degree possible to the, to the greatest uh, ideal of perfection that I think a person can sustain to. And then the rest of that quote, the second part, which is like, let everything else roll off your back. I think this is also just as important because I think if you don't take things personally, if you let things kind of just gloss by you, which is to say that you're also receiving a lot of information at all times. As you go through our lives, especially with social media, there's a lot of data coming in. And the fact of the matter is that a lot of that data is inconsequential towards something that we may want to achieve or that we may want to do. And so maybe if it's on a performance level, let's just say maybe the audience doesn't seem to be as lively as the other night. Or one of our colleagues or someone in our dressing room is talking about something that may, that's maybe a little bit negative. Letting these things roll off your back is, is so hard to do. And it's very, it's very much common sense, but it's, it's, it's incredibly helpful. And then the last part about that quote is uh, have a little sense of humor about your appearance. Well, like the duck, I, you know, it doesn't seem as if like the duck takes itself like that seriously. And I, <laughs> and I think that to, to use another kind of quote from someone else uh, whom I don't remember, but it's that we're all building sandcastles. So just to not take it so seriously, and especially on the entertainment side, you know, a lot of times my job can just be summarized by going where people tell me to go, changing into whatever costume looks ridiculous, and then climbing up a thing. That's it. That's all that I have to do. Effectively, that's really all that I have to do. And so I think to have a little sense of humor about it, not take it too seriously, enjoy it, can also make the hard work seem easier and also more enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. I love the breakdown. And you're right. I think so often as entertainers, we can very easily get into taking ourselves to seriously land. Of course, what we're doing is serious. It's our job. It's our livelihood. It's our art. We are giving so much of ourselves, both emotionally and physically, to everything that we're doing. So it makes sense that we would be upset if things are going the way they are or that we take it very seriously. But like you said, when you really break it down, what are you doing? You're just going out stage, you're singing and dancing, which you've probably been doing, or climbing ropes, that you've been doing since you were a child for many of us. And it's really, it's just meant to be fun. It's stuff people do just to have a good time most of the time. And we're just fortunate that it happens to be our job and to not lose sight of that, because that is what people come to see. That is what people enjoy about the arts. And that's really why we began doing it in the first place. Exactly. Exactly. If you think about a lot of the physical activities that entertainers have to do, it's really the same thing that we encourage kids to do just to play around. So if what we're doing for a living is play and just to play around and kind of goof around a bit, and then to be able to get to do that for a living, I think is, is pretty... It's pretty great. And it's, it's fairly rare to be able to do that. So the, the levity and to, to not take it too seriously, even though we all kind of tend to, especially I think if you're dedicated to your craft and you'll look at it like that, like it's a craft, but also reminded that your craft is also a lot of, a lot of part of it's just play. So just enjoy it. Absolutely. And let's move on to this next section here. And Tristan, of course, you are an entertainer. I am an entertainer. And I think that you'd agree, this industry can be one of the most subjective, brutally honest, personally emotional industries in existence. And you know as well as I that in order to create and have a successful career in this industry, like you're having now, takes a lot of dedication and hard work. And while, yeah, there is an outrageous amount of fun and excitement doing what we do, 
There are also our fair share of obstacles, challenges, and failures we are going to experience and we are going to have to move forward through. So tell us, what is one key challenge, obstacle, or failure you've experienced in your career? And how did you come out the other side better because of it? There's a lot of, I would say, many little upsets, many failures, things that have beset I would say the path that I've taken, but the crucial one that really sticks out to me is really when I was first starting to train aerial straps, just specifically. So this was around, I'm going to say 2010. I had just started training. I had more or less finished working with this one trainer uh, who is uh, a former acrobat, former performer, and he was coaching me just for general conditioning. But then I realized pretty quickly that I need to find someone who would train me specifically for straps. And it just turned out to be incredibly difficult to find that person. I mean, look at it from the other side. You meet someone who is in his late 20s, never did any gymnastics, never did any dance. He says he wants to get into circus. He says that he's willing to train, but maybe he's really rough around the edges in terms of like what he's able to do. Not in a personality sense, but just in the sense, I mean, I would think, I hope, but just in the <laughs> sense of, just in the sense of what he's, you know, he's a slow learner. So enough about talking about me like the third, like the third person, but would you, how, how likely would you give that person a chance? So I really, the biggest, it wasn't like a failure, but the obstacle it would be was that I, there was a period of time where I was just really desperate for a coach. And these days it's 2020, a lot of people do straps now, but straps was not at that level of popularity in 2010. You also have to realize this is really like pre major days of any social like media. So you, you can't see a lot of the aerial stuff that you would see now digitally. Back then, it was really, I would say, tissue was like the main thing. And so just finding, trying to find a coach, I was driven to such desperation that I would go to a party, and I don't even like going to parties because I'm a bit of an introvert. So I would go to parties on the hopes that I would meet somebody from the Cirque or circus world who could then connect me to someone. And I would just try to network, and I would ask everyone, and I would get a lot of no's. Or I would also get a lot of fake yeses, which hurt even more. You know, somebody was like, oh, I'm so willing to coach you. And then you follow up with them and then they're never available or they stand you up for a lesson or they, or they don't follow back. Like that, that, that was, it, it, got pretty, it got pretty painful for a while. And then you wonder if the dream that you have is really worth having. That's, that's, that, that would say that was the toughest moment. And clearly you found someone to, to train you, right? I did. I did. It, it did take some time. But I would say that what made me, I would say, better because of it was simply that, A, I think it taught me the lesson of that you have to go beyond the point where you think you're going to turn back. So despite how painful it may be to face the obstacle, if you can keep going, keep going. And I think if you don't think you can keep going, maybe still keep on going because maybe you don't even think about it. Just keep on going despite however painful it may be. And then it also, the, the second part of that is that once I did find my coach, who's a, who's, a, who's a really, really great coach for me, I'm so grateful for him in my life, is to be really grateful for those people. Because then you, the, this I think instilled me a certain sense of, of gratitude and appreciation for those who really have helped me out along this performing industry and this performing path. Love it. And let's move on to this section here, to a time that... I like to call your spotlight moment that one moment in time you realized, yes, I am going to be an entertainer for a living. Or maybe it was, yes, this is what I need to be doing as an entertainer. Tell us about that. So this spotlight moment happened for me right around, I would say, the year 2007, maybe 2008. Mm -hmm. My sister, who was at the time also in Las Vegas, she took me to see the Beatles Love Show by Cirque du Soleil at the Mirage. And what was so crazy to me, I had never, never seen a big show like that in, in my life at all. And just even the entrance to it was really cool to me. And I just mean just the entrance to the theater I thought was like really cool. Yeah. So had like these lights that were flashing. And then I see the show... And it was so, I guess, just re it was really magical for me and really majestic. I had never seen anything like it. And at this point in time, really, I was 
just starting out as a yoga teacher. So I wasn't even thinking about performing, but then I saw this show and I saw what the aerialists were doing. And then in one of the closing numbers, it's not one of the last numbers, but one of the closing numbers, there's an aerialist who's on straps and she's flying through the air. And I just remember thinking while this woman, this performer was in the spotlight swirling around, I was thinking, God, it, it just, it would be so nice to be able to do that. It would just be so nice to be able to do that. And I think that was the spark that kind of ignited this really, really slow burn that took years and years later to then really ignite into a full flame where I then left the job of teaching yoga to pursue training and to pursue performing full time. But it wasn't until many, many years later until that actually came true. I love that. That's great. And let's piggyback on that real quick and talk about your number one booked it moment. Walk us through that day, the auditions and callbacks, if they happen to be a part of it. What was going on in your life? And what about that moment makes it your favorite booked it moment? So if we go from the point of where I just watched this, uh, where I just seen the show with my sister and we zip forward in time, past training and past numerous other kind of yoga jobs, et cetera, et cetera. I had already done a Cirque General audition and got a call back for the second day, but did not get to finish the full audition. They effectively just dismissed me. They said I had to work on more things and that I wasn't really ready for them. And then we zip forward in time. I eventually found my way to doing a couple of these Cirque sponsored events uh, called One Night for One Drop. And I had done a couple of them. I was back up for one and then I was in another one. And then the after the one I was in, I did that. And it was such a high just to be on the stage and just to do that. But it's a charity event. It's, it's an unpaid gig, but I thought that it would be good for me. But then after that, there was just nothing. There was just nothing. And it really felt like in these like ensuing months and months of not hearing anything, trying to follow up with my leads. It once again felt almost like how I had felt when I couldn't find a straps or aerial coach. I, it really did honestly feel as if my leads were going nowhere. So at that moment, I decided to do something different. I said that in a way, I'd, at that moment, I kind of gave up thinking about maybe trying to get into Cirque. I was like, maybe it's just not for me. But I, I have been training, so I put together a little collection of some of the movements and some of the footage of stuff that I had done, and I put it into a small little reel. I edited it, and then I put up this little resume, and then I started to send out my footage and all my stuff to all the production companies pretty much around the world. I decided that with the new year that I would then start to really send out all these emails and do all this research et cetera, et cetera. And I was collecting all these email addresses and I was half excited about it, but also honestly half feeling kind of defeated. And then this was in December. So I decided that I'll start out sending out all these emails in January. This was right after Christmas, before New Year's. I randomly then got a call from Cirque and Cirque said that they had this position available in the Beatles Love Show, the first show that I had seen by Cirque that so enraptured me to performance. And they had a position open and of course, I accepted. Wow, that is amazing. I love that story. And I love your entire journey, how you never gave up, how you just kept on pushing forward and you, and you hit those walls multiple times. And you had that conversation with yourself about, God, do, do I keep going? Is this worth it? Is, it? is it for me? And you just kept pushing forward and you kept pushing forward. And look what's happened. You've achieved everything that you set out to achieve. Sure, it probably took you a few more years than you originally anticipated, but here you are and you did it. It's amazing. No, oh, thanks, Dane. Yeah, it's really, it's really nice of you to say. Thanks. Great. Well, let's take a moment to talk about the present. What projects are you working on now? What are you looking forward to? And look, it's a crazy weird time. We are amidst this global pandemic how do you see the entertainment industry moving forward in the next couple of years? Dane, I love how you always have uh, five questions to ask. Okay, I'll try to, I'll try to hit all of them. I'll try to I know, this, this so, is like the multi-question question. <laughs> well, so first of all, I am working on a brand new project where I combine paint and my aerial acrobatics. So I'm making effectively aerial art. Very cool. And that's what I'm really looking forward to. That's what I'm doing. It's something that hasn't been done before, not that I'm aware of at least. And I think that this will be one of the projects that I'll really devote myself towards 
at least for the foreseeable future. Outside of maintaining my regular aerial discipline and my regular conditioning and all that sort of my regular movement vocabulary, but this will be the project that I really want to do. Brilliant. And am I correct in assuming you're painting on canvas? I'm going to try out a whole variety of media. I started off doing charcoal and pastel just to get some of the techniques down. But now I've moved on to paint on canvas, but I'm already ex also exploring things with other textures as well. So obviously you're going to have a an end product, right? But is part of this experience also going to be a bit of a performance art as well in creating? I think for the way that I want to do it, I think I want it to, it to be both for sure. I think that the performance element almost kind of takes care of itself. Mm -hmm. I think that if I'm doing something up in the air and I'm drizzling or slashing or creating like some, some movement up there and paint's already involved, I think that already lends to it a good amount of spectacle. But I also want to create some really, I, I would hope, really interesting finished pieces that can stand on their own too. I think that's been the real challenge for me and the real focus is that I think I could very easily just go upside down and throw some paint on a canvas. But then the next question you would, that you would have to ask is, well, while that is definitely appealing on the performance aspect, is how much of that you, would you really want to see hung up on a wall in your own house? Right. So then, so I'm, I'm, working on, I'm working on both. I'm trying to make it both a cool spectacle and also something where if you didn't know anything about it, if you didn't know that I had to go high up in the air on a motor or I was upside down or I was spinning while I was creating whatever effect you saw on the canvas, that even if you didn't know any of that, that, you, that when you saw the artwork, you would still feel something, still feel that it's interesting, then that will be my success. Very cool. I love that idea. That's amazing. Keep me posted as you move forward with that. Will do. Will do. And now to answer your other question about how do I see the entertainment industry moving forward, it's a tough question. I would also be just as curious to hear what all of your other uh, interviewees have also said. But what I would conjecture is that I do think that there will be a small interim period in which things will be very rocky. And this is the period that we're in right now. But if we look to the past of, shall we say, the Spanish flu of the 19, 1918, it took ballpark around three years for things to be almost back in full swing. Uh, I think a lot of the pandemic was already kind of over around a certain amount of time, but in terms of the economic recovery, it took around three years. So I wouldn't be surprised if, let's say, we were to have this interview again in 2023, and I would say then that it would almost be as if no, I'm not going to say that as if nothing has changed, but I think a lot of things will come back in full swing for sure. I'm, I'm fairly optimistic about how the entertainment industry will not only be able to rebound eventually, but that we need, just need to overcome this slightly rocky period. Absolutely. I love your insight on that. Thank you. And it is time to move on to one of my favorite sections in the interview. I call it the Grease Lightning Round. Lightning Round. <laughs> I am going to ask you a handful of questions. I want you to answer them as quickly and concisely as possible, one after another. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Go Grease Lightning. <laughs> first question. What was the one thing holding you back from committing to a career as an entertainer? Nothing really outside of my own profile. Great. Second question. What is the best piece of advice you have ever received? A quote from my old violin teacher served actually as the best piece of advice for almost anything, but especially for straps and for aerial. And he said, slow practice, fast progress. Fast practice, slow progress. No practice, no progress. Love that. And the third question, what is working for you now? Or if you'd like to go pre-COVID, what was working for you before our industry went on pause? I think something that's working for me right now is to really tune into my own individual sense of harmony, which is to say, how much rest do I need? How much intense work do I need? and really trying to figure out what is a really good ratio. I think that we should always be able to kind of work pretty consistently and not feel burnout. I also think that we should also be able to get enough rest, but then not become, shall we say, lazy or, or a slob. And But finding some balance in between, some harmony in between those two extremes is, I think, the, the thing that is working for me the most right now. And just to even think about that is already, I think, more than half the battle. 
Absolutely. And I love that you brought that up because I'm sure you can relate that for many of us in this industry that it is or it can be go, 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 go all the time. You always have your head down doing something, looking for the next gig, the next job, training, getting better, doing this, networking. There's always something to do. And I think that this pandemic, this forced pause has allowed many of us to get to where you are right now, where you're having these reflective moments. And like you said, trying to find that idyllic ratio of work and rest and harmony within your own self. Exactly. Exactly. Wonderful. Fourth question. What is your best resource? Whether that is a book, a movie, a YouTube video, a podcast, maybe a piece of technology that you found is helping your career right now. It's tough for me to divide it up into one best single resource, but I will actually say Evernote. I love Evernote so much. It's a, it is a digital online and it's also an app note-taking system. And you can upload audio clips to it. You can upload an uh, image to it or just images in general. You can also dictate into it. There's a lot of things that you can do with Evernote and it all syncs up on a cloud. So you can have it on your phone or on your laptop, wherever you are. And I love Evernote so much because effectively it is my hub of all my notes. And because I still give myself, shall we say not a grade, but at least a performance metric. So I watch how much uh, it is that I'm working out. I watch how much I'm doing conditioning. Evernote records all of that for me. I come up with all these very different notes, these different kind of categorization systems. And because it's all in the cloud, I can keep notes and keep on creating notes effectively forever and I won't lose them. So that's what's been really, really great. I love that. And I love Evernote. In fact, you turned me on to Evernote. <laughs> that's right, Dane. That's, that's right. right. And you know, cyclical. That's how it goes. Exactly. And the fifth question, if you had to start your career from scratch, but you still had all the knowledge and experience you've collected from your career in this industry, what would you do or not do? Would you do anything differently or would you keep it the same? So I wouldn't alter much in terms of my training. I would say that the only thing that I would do maybe a little bit differently would be to consider how to audition, the skills of how to audition, because that's a separate skill set. You can train as much as you want, but auditioning is its own skill set. And part of that within that skill set is to not take things personally. It goes back to that Seinfeld quote about letting things roll off your back. Absolutely. I love that. And the last question, what is the golden nugget knowledge drop you have learned from your successful career in this industry you want to leave with our listeners? This will be a tough golden nugget for me to keep brief. So I'm sorry if this goes on long, but I do think this is so important that I have to discuss it. Yeah. But it's called the Pareto or Pareto, don't know how to pronounce it, but Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule which is that 80% of your results will come from 20% of input. So if you think about it, 20% of your input creates 80% of your results. And this 80-20 rule, this principle applies for so many things, especially in the realm of economics, we can apply it for business, but you can also apply it, for example, for performance. So if you're looking at your own, or if I'm looking at, for example, my own conditioning, what this means is that 80% of my strength or any 80% of my results on anything that I do on straps will probably come from only 20% of what it is that I actually need to practice. So now that comes a question that, okay, so let's say it comes from a few things. What are those crucial few things that I need to practice so that I can improve almost everything else? And although this is something that you might continually revise, I think, especially for straps practice, I delineate it to enough few things that I can now really streamline my practice and make it really efficient. But you can use this for anything. You can use this for dance. You can use this for uh, gymnastics, general acrobatics. I'm sure you could even apply it to singing practices and acting and anything else that a performer would ever want to do is to look at what few exercises are so essential that they then can govern the rest of your performance. I love that. I love that principle. I've seen it many, many times. And I love your outlook on that. And I 100% agree with you. And the goal then is to, like you said, figure out what those key things are so you can be efficient with your training, with whatever it is that you're working to accomplish. Yes. And 
To wrap up this baby, Tristan, it is time to give yourself a plug. Where can we find you? How do our listeners connect with you? And is there anything you want to promote? Well, I think the easiest way to find me would probably be on Instagram. So my handle is at Tristan G, T-R-I-S-T-A-N-J-I-H. And I also have a website, a little blog, where I share some of the insights that I've gleaned from my time spent in the circus and in the performance world. And the website is also just my name. So it's TristanG.com, T-R-I-S-T-A-N-J-I-H. Dot com. So either of those two places would be a great way to uh, get a hold of me. And stay tuned, obviously, for the aerial art that will hopefully by the time that this comes out, hopefully there will be some samples that you guys can see maybe on Instagram or on the website. Wonderful. And for everyone listening out there, I have put the links to both of those things he just said into the description of this episode. Tristan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your journey. It's been wonderful to have you on. Oh, no, no. The pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much, Dane. All the best. Thank you so much for joining us today. My one call to action for you is to go to youbookedpodcast.com and join our free email community, where we dig deep into a continually growing resource of truly actionable things you can be doing right now to help advance your entertainment career. Don't miss an episode. We have a new guest seven days a week. Search for You Booked It on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app and subscribe today. All the best to you. We'll see you tomorrow.